This is WEFT Champaign, 90.1 FM, community radio for East Central Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org. The views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of WFT, its board of directors, associates, its station manager, or Prairie Air Incorporated. The following program is pre-recorded and consists of two parts. The first part is a rebroadcast of a program first aired in 2011. The second part was recorded on February 7, 2015. Welcome to Weekend Heartbeat. I'm Sean David, and this is A New Lamp. New Lamp for Old. New lamp for old. Remember how Aladdin headed out to get oil for his mother's old dent and tarnished lamp? And in the market, he met a magician calling out these words. This strange man was offering to give him a brand new shiny lamp for his old one. That's what I want to offer you, if you'll have it. A new lamp of spiritual guidance. But maybe you already have such a lamp, which still burns brightly. Great. You are still welcome to join us simply to learn who we are. But maybe your lamp of divine guidance has gotten dented and tarnished like Aladdin's. Or perhaps you have no such lamp at all. To you, I offer a new lamp. Hi, my name is Marilyn. Welcome to A New Lamp, a program designed to make you acquainted with the Baha'i religious faith. I hope you will choose to spend the next few minutes with me. Thanks.
Today, we continue our story about the Bab, the forerunner of Baha'u'llah. The Bab wrote many things, drastically new ideas for that day. His main book is the Persian Bayan, B-A-Y-O-N, in which he establishes new laws. Both secular and religious leaders were doing everything in their power to kill this new movement. The Bab was imprisoned in the mountains of Persia and eventually taken to Tabriz, where he was executed. Now, I'm going to tell you a true story, and if you choose to question my honesty, I would understand. I refer you to the newspaper archives of that era in Europe and see the story in print as witnessed by reporters who were there that day. The execution was to take place in the army barracks where he and a companion, Anis, were being held. The commander of the Armenian regiment did not want to do it. He believed the Bab to be a good man and went to see him. He said he was a Christian and felt strongly that this execution was wrong. The Bab told the commander to stay with his assignment. If he were sincere, God would relieve him of it. When the guard came to get the Bab and his disciple who was to die with him, the Bab asked the guard to wait briefly while he finished some business. His request was denied. The Bab and Anis with him were suspended on a wall. Thousands of onlookers were there as a full regiment of 750 guns prepared to fire, 250 at a time. The order was given. The guns fired. When the smoke cleared, the Bab was not there, and his companion was standing there alive. The ropes had been severed by the bullets. The Bab was found finishing up his business and then returned to once again face the firing squad. The Armenian commander refused to do this again. Another regiment was brought in and the execution accomplished. Although the two men's bodies were shattered into one mass of flesh, their faces were untouched. The bodies were thrown into a moat and a guard set over them. However, a brave disciple was able to remove the bodies and hide them. Over many years, they were moved from place to place in hiding under the direction of Baha'u'llah and are now entombed in the Shrine of the Bab on the side of Mount Carmel in Haifa, Israel, the world center of the faith. They pulled the bodies down from the post Laid them out on the stones Dragged their remains through crowded streets to dump At the edge of a moat I'm soldiers were placed Guard at the site To stop anyone coming near That the indignity could be seen far and wide The outcome was certain and clear the outcome was certain and clear But rivers of light Were guiding their path Guiding their course Were there at their side That most sacred trust Was washed in the night By rivers of light by rivers of light Suleiman Khan He came to Tabriz One thing he had in mind To rescue the Bab Wherever he was Even if he had to die He told the Mir The Mir had a friend Who was born With a cast iron will He stole the bodies For Suleiman Khan who wrapped them in covers of silk Who wrapped them in covers of silk Rivers of light Wending their way The long winding road Down to the sea A far away bay Was ever in sight of rivers of light Of rivers of light Baha'u'llah charted each step of their path Each move the casket would take 
Kept in one place at least 18 years until he thought it unsafe. The summons they came, move it again. Friends took it out in the night. When they opened the lid to check the shroud, they found a dried flower inside. They found a dried flower inside. Suleiman Khan, did you place that flower so tenderly in that dark hour before you went out? Out like a fire on rivers of light, on rivers of light. Thirty more years that trust changed hands from mosques to the homes of the friends. Till the call came, send it with care to its final destination. Via Baghdad, Damascus, Beirut. That precious trust traveled on, reaching Akar on the thirty-first day of the year, eighteen ninety-nine. Of the year eighteen ninety-nine, Abdul Baha was the one who took charge, and after ten years, replaced the bow. Tears fell like rain, silver and fine, like rivers of light, like rivers of light, rivers of light, guiding their path, guiding their course. Were there at their side, if you go to Carmel. By day or by night, you'll find the shrine bathed in rivers of light. Had you believed in me, O、oh、wayward generation, every one of you would have followed the example of this youth, who stood in rank above most of you, and willingly would have sacrificed himself in my path. The day will come when you will have recognized me. That day, I shall have ceased to be with you. The Bab. So much for being with me this morning. I hope you have found a blessing during these few minutes. If you want to learn more about the Baha'i Religion, you can go online to www.bahai.us. To contact me, my email address is a new lamp at yahoo.com. Thanks, and have a great day. Over 150 years, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has fostered educational experiences and pioneered innovations with one very clear and simple goal: to change the world for the better. 
No matter where you are, the University of Illinois is providing information on their plans to maximize the health and safety of their students, faculty, staff, and university community during the COVID-19 pandemic. For more information, please visit https colon forward slash forward slash covid19 dot illinois dot edu programming at weft is brought to you in part by common ground food co-op due to the drastic nature of the covid19 pandemic common ground is making some changes to their hours and to their department which will affect shoppers for more information please visit common ground dot co-op Throughout this health emergency, please remember that we're in this together and we will get through it together. The School of Social Works Learning Community Lab and UniPlace Christian Church have created a resource guide listing several of the community's resources during the COVID crisis. These include food distributions, shelter and housing assistance, restaurants offering free meals, legal aid, immigrants in CU, child care resources, support groups, clothing, transportation, and internet. You can access it on your browser at go.illinois.edu slash community resources. One word, no space. Again, that's go.illinois.edu slash community resources. Good afternoon, and welcome back to this portion of A New Lamp. Our guest today is Matt Gianni, who has recently moved into our area from Texas, and we are so glad to have him with us today. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Now, let's see. We'd like to find out a little bit about our guests before we go on to today's topic. Uh, Now, let's see. I see that you are a research assistant professor in the Department of Education Policy, Organization, and Leadership at the U of I. Correct. And uh, so that's that's interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So... um... I'm actually a recent transplant to Illinois, so before we moved up in September, my wife and I were living in Texas, uh, from Texas originally, and uh, I was working on my PhD in education policy at the University mm-hmm. of Texas at Austin, and just got this position, uh, moved up, started in October, so been here for a few months. Um, but yeah, I was uh, you know, very blessed to be raised in a Baha'i family, both uh, my father and mother became Baha'i when they were young, um, neither of them was raised in the faith. Um, but they both became Baha'is uh, shortly mm-hmm. before they got married, and then I was uh, raised in the Baha'i faith as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Now, uh, you have come to Champaign-Urbana, mm-hmm. which is it's not a dinky little town, <laughs> but neither is it anywhere near as big as what you came from. That's true. And we have a small Baha'i community here, and I understand your you folks were in a very pretty large size Baha'i community. Yes. Basically all of the communities, most of the communities I've lived in have been pretty large. So I'm from Houston originally, and mm-hmm. Houston has quite a large Baha'i community. Um, and my wife is from Dallas, which also has a very large community. And uh, for some reason, many Iranians, I'm sure we'll talk about this as we get into the program, but many Iranians, given the persecution in the Baha'i, uh, the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran, fled from Iran and came to different places in the United States, and both of those communities had very large populations of people that had fled the persecution and settled in the United States. Um, So both of those communities were very large. Austin was also a very large community, so it's been somewhat of a transition, but everyone's been so nice. You know, we've got that Midwestern hospitality (laughs) so far. You know, it's just been a great transition. (laughs) That's great. Well, I tell you, we're really glad to have you folks have joined us here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, So we want to think about the situation on education Mm -hmm. of the Baha'i youth in Iran. Uh, A few years ago, I actually had a newspaper item in the News Gazette about the situation when we were asked to uh, kind of let it be known to our local communities what's going on. Uh, And since that time, it's still a problem, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I was really... Uh, happy that the devotional program that preceded this interview was, um, you know, talking about the Bob, who is the forerunner of Baha'u'llah. Um, and the Bob really epitomizes a lot of the persecution that the early Baha'is have faced really since the founding of the Baha'i faith, you know. And some estimates are that about approximately 20,000 people, 20,000 Baha'is have been executed from the time the Baha'i faith was founded in Iran alone by the Iranian government. Right. Um, so... 
And Baha'u'llah really talks about that this is a central theme of every faith. Every time a new messenger of God comes and has a new message, that message often challenges the orthodoxy, right? It challenges mm -hmm. the prevailing norms, it challenges the power structure, and that often leads in a lot of pushback, a lot of persecution, a lot of harassment, and other things. And that's definitely been the case with the Baha'i faith as well. Um, so, I mean, very serious persecution and executions and things for the entire history of the faith uh, in Iran. And then that changed a little bit before the Iranian Revolution. Um, there was a time when the Baha'i community started getting recognized more for its mm -hmm. efforts for promoting peace, for promoting education, promoting unity. Um, and there was a pretty, it wasn't a perfectly easy relationship between the government and the Baha'is, but there at least wasn't as much outright persecution. Right. And then, of course, the revolution happened in 1979. Um, and since that time, things have gotten far worse for the Baha'is. And one of the you know, facets of that discrimination has been the denial of Baha'is to um, access to higher education. Um, so that's part of what the campaign is currently focusing on. Uh, the education is not a crime campaign. That education has been considered a crime for Baha'is in Iran. And that seems very ironic because you know generally people pursuing education developing their skills developing mm -hmm. their knowledge you know developing their talents and finding ways to contribute to their soci society is something that's so valued in almost yeah. every civilization right. on the planet right but yet for the baha'is in iran that's a crime that you are literally persecuted thrown in jail simply for trying to pursue higher education so there was a film by a documentary filmmaker named maziar bahari Right. Um, the film is called To Light a Candle, and uh, Bahari's a uh, very well-respected, well-known journalist, filmmaker, human rights activist. Um, and Daily Show guest. Daily Show guest, absolutely. Yeah, he's probably most well-known for a book called And Then They Came For Me, I believe is the name of the memoir. Mm -hmm. So he was... Um, he was educated in Canada, where he went to school uh, to be a filmmaker and journalist. Um, and then after that, he worked for Newsweek and BBC and many other organizations. So in 2009, around the time of the Iranian uh, election, he traveled to Iran to just interview people, you know, do his mm -hmm. uh, film work, documentary work um, at that time. And he got captured by the Iranian government for being a dissident, a revolutionary, for various reasons. And he ends up getting thrown in jail. He's in jail for four months. He's tortured, he's beaten. Um, he loses 25 pounds wow. during the time just because they were you know, denying him uh, food. And it just sounded like a really awful endeavor. And every day he said his guard would come to him and say, you know everyone's forgotten you, right? You know your execution's tomorrow. Did you know that? You, we forgot to tell you that it's tomorrow, right? So tonight's your last night. So just make peace with yourself. <laughs> right. with the, you know. um, now so, this man is not a Baha'i. Is that no, true? No, and he's not a Baha'i, but he, from his experience, just um, firsthand of the Iranian government's persecution of people yes. that challenge the power structure there, he became familiar with B the Baha'is because the sure. Baha'is have a very similar story. They're trying to promote positive ideals, unity, all these things, mm -hmm. but they've been met with so much persecution from the government. Um, so he made this film, To Light a Candle, which is really about both the persecution the Baha'is have faced, but more importantly, their kind of constructive resilience in the face of this persecution, and in particular, how they've created... Um, voluntary forms of higher education for themselves um, and an organization called the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education, which is the Baha'i community's kind of voluntary network of educators and administrators um, that's used to kind of provide education to those Baha'i students that have been denied access to higher education by the government. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. I know a couple of uh, professors in Illinois mm. who uh, have been part of that. Mm. So I, I thought that was uh, pretty neat yeah, that they were teaching the Iranian Baha'is from <laughs> their homes. Yeah, <laughs> and that's one of the really fascinating things about the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education is that it started in, I believe, 1985 or 1987, if I remember correctly. And at that time, mm -hmm. no, no internet, no Skype, no email, no anything, you know? <laughs> right. So this education, this university education was occurring by professors in isolation developing curricula, developing coursework, developing assignments, mm -hmm. then 
getting it to couriers who would then kind of secretly go through the community and find the students that have enrolled in the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education, hand them the assignments. The students in isolation would do the assignments by themselves, give the assignments back to the courier, and then that would go back to the, to the teachers would, because they, okay. couldn't, they couldn't congregate in the same place because mm -hmm. that would raise the suspicions of the government. That would result in them cracking down on you know, Baha'is trying to assemble. So it started off, you know, in this way, and it's just like, you just don't think of that being a university education. But now with the advances in technology, we see people who are volunteering to be instructors all over the world, you know? So we have many people in the United States that are now teachers for the mm -hmm. Baha'i Institute for Higher Education. Um, and it's really amazing that the technological advancements have allowed the community to really thrive in this effort to really overcome a lot of the persecution they've faced. But, and um, I understand too that uh, once they have graduated from the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education, that in many places, this uh, they can transfer this to uh, a regular university mm -hmm. be, and receive their credits for it. Yeah. And so it's uh, it's not just a little fly by night thing. And yet, it's just a few years ago that I believe um, the teachers there in Iran were gathered up, arrested, and are still in prison. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's it's just always amazing to me. I, one of the more recent persecutions that upset me quite a bit was uh, just a few months ago in Shiraz when the cemetery mm -hmm. was uh, totally devastated by the Revolutionary Guard uh, mm -hmm. who had bought the area. They just tossed the caskets out and they're going to build a sports complex mm -hmm. wow. on this. So and, and that I just found that just, uh, that, that place holds many of the martyrs. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would have been killed in in seventy nine. Mm -hmm. uh, the teachers mm -hmm. who who were killed at that time. And it's so. another interesting <clears throat> parallel between what's going on right now and mm -hmm. the devotional program you provided this morning, talking about the Bob, mm -hmm. who was executed, and his remains could not be disclosed. The location of his remains could not be disclosed because the government would have come and taken them away. Right. So the remains of the Bob were transported from location to location for something like 30 years, I believe, or somewhere in that time frame, um, simply because that's just another facet of the persecution that will even destroy the dead, right? Even right. after they're already dead, we'll try to destroy their remains, destroy mm -hmm. their burial sites, um, simply to try to break the will and break the heart of the Baha'i community. Right. And in uh, Bahari's film, To Light a Candle, there's some amateur footage of an Iranian Baha'i who's uh, taking video footage of a Baha'i grave in Iran, a Baha'i grave site that mm -hmm. has recently been desecrated by the local community. Um, and the, the unfortunate thing in these situations is that it's not the government itself that's always doing it, but a lot of times it's the local clergy that's arousing up the yes. passions of the individuals there and that are saying, oh, these Baha'is, they're doing all these terrible things, we should go do this to them. So it's mm -hmm. the community themselves that go up and, um, you know, end up doing all these awful things. Um, so, yeah, it's it's very unfortunate, but, you know, hopefully we can bring more attention to the situation, put more pressure on the community so these things don't continue to happen. Hey, Matt, I got a question. Sure. Um, I was wondering where this all kind of came from, of all of the ways to persecute a religious minority. Mm -hmm. It seems that denying them education is not the first one that comes to mind. Yeah. Is there a, a history behind that, where that came from? Yeah, it's actually a very interesting history. So as I mentioned previously, uh, the period leading up to the Isra Islamic Revolution, um, there was actually a decent amount of tolerance for the Baha'i community. They weren't being outright persecuted by the current regime. Um, and one of the things that the Baha'i community really emphasized was education. And one of the Baha'i principles is universal education, the establishment of education for all people, regardless of background or income or anything else. Um, so Baha'is did that in Iran, just like they do in every community where there's a sufficient number of Baha'is to establish education. So the Baha'i schools were extremely popular in Iran in the 40s, 50s, 60s, leading up to the revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and not just by Baha'is, but by all folks, all people in Iran would 
really flock to these schools, um, largely because we had a lot of progressive principles that were really infused into the curriculum. Um, so emphasizing the oneness of humanity, the equality of men and women, you know, all of these ideals that were very progressive. Um, so although the schools were very popular, um, as you know, we got leading up to the kind of regime change, mm -hmm. there was increasing skepticism about this form of Baha'i education because uh -huh. these ideals weren't just viewed as progressive, they were viewed as Western, right? right. right. So mm -hmm. a focus on material development and developing your skills in order to kind of promote material development, that, that seemed very Western. The equality of men and women, that was a very Western ideal. Oneness of humanity, that was very Western. Oneness of religion. So all of these principles that were central to the faith came to be associated by the Iranian government with Westernism. So when the Iranian Revolution happened, um, there was a big uh, condemnation and criticism of all things Western, and, um, you know, the Baha'is were kind of swept up in that. So, you know, as I also mentioned, the initial phase of the Iran's, uh, Iranian regime's persecution of the Baha'is was imprisonment, execution, capturing, all these types of things. Right. Um, but one of the themes of the Baha'i faith that Shoghi Effendi, the Guardian, talks about is um, this dynamism of crisis and victory, right? That there's all these crises that occur in the faith, but they're often followed by victories. Yes. Um, so, you know, there was all of this outright persecution, these killings, these imprisonments. Um, but one of the things that started happening is that it made more people hear about the faith and more right. people come in contact with it. Mm -hmm. And often it increased the popularity of the faith. Um, so eventually, because of that, that kind of reaction, as well as some international pressure against the Iranian regime, they moved away from this outright persecution and execution and things like that. But at the same time, they thought to themselves, well, how do we keep down a people? How yeah. do we suppress their progress um, if we can't just murder them all, essentially? Right. Right. Well, one of the ways to do that is to <laughs> deny them access to education, to prevent mm -hmm. them from developing their skills, to prevent them from getting into these positions of power, whether it's owning businesses or being lawyers or working in the government, all of which are illegal to Baha'is now. So not only are they denied access to higher education, but they can't work for the government. A, a lot of times if they own a business, their business will be seized by the local government and yes. it is no longer theirs. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all of these forms of kind of suppression of their progress. And there was actually this very um, haunting memo that was written by the Iranian government, by one agency of the Iranian government, mm -hmm. that talks about um, the way that the government needs to go about persecuting the Baha'is and specifically blocking their cultural prog progress and prosperity. And this is wow. one of the letters that's highlighted in To Light a Candle in Bahari's documentary. I haven't um, heard of that. Before. Yeah, it's, it's so basically it's this memo is written um, by this group responsible for the kind of cultural integrity of the Iranian community. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically say, you know, we can't keep killing them. We can't keep just outright executing them. It's not working, but we have to deny their progress and prosperity somehow. So let's do that by denying them access to higher education. <laughs> so this wow. is an official memo from the Iranian government, and mm -hmm. this was communicated to all deans and presidents of the universities throughout the country. Um, so now if a uh, Baha'i applies to the University of Tehran or any other university, um, as soon as it's discovered that they're Baha'i, they're immediately kicked out. Wow. Um, so that's been, that's kind of the history of why denying higher education in particular has become kind of the staple of the suppression um, of the Iranian regime against the Baha'i community. Now they do get elementary education, is that right? They do, um, and I, I'm not an expert on that necessarily, but, you know, the other... So I should say one facet of this persecution is the de denial of education. Mm -hmm. The other facet is the promotion of miseducation about the Baha'is. <laughs> so there's right. a whole lot of propaganda against the Baha'is mm -hmm. that's per per propagated excuse me, by the Iranian government, particularly through the education system. Mm -hmm. So a lot of... Um, Iranian non-Baha'is would say, oh, I learned about the Baha'i faith when I was growing up, but I hear it's they're all heretics, they promote prostitution and, you know, uh, deception and lying and all these terrible things because that's the kind of official um, 
understanding, if you will, of the Baha'i community that's kind of promoted through education. So, right. so you have that going on. Baha'is are still allowed to go through kind of elementary education and up to a certain point. But once they get to higher education, you know, they're denied right. access. Huh. You know, one of uh, the interesting stories that's highlighted in this documentary is this uh, young Baha'i who was, you know, raised in Iran, applied to university, got accepted, and it, it eventually became known that she was Baha'i and she was kicked out of the university. And she heard about the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education and she eventually became a BIAG student. Um, and, you know, she talked about how difficult studying at BIHE was because of all this correspondence going back and forth with the professor and you don't have classrooms and da-da-da. Mm -hmm. She said one of the difficulties is that she didn't have access to books and curriculum. You know, she just ah. couldn't find them. Right. Right. And once again, this isn't Baha'i material. This isn't our holy scriptures. This is a chemistry book. You know, this is <laughs> yeah. a physics yes. textbook. So what she would do is she would get the, the identification cards of her friends who were enrolled in the university in order to get access to the library. Mm -hmm. So she would fake her identification using her friend's ID in order to get access to the library. And I'm like, it's, if that's not the most noble use of a fake ID I've ever heard, you know, I mean, if, if that's what everyone used fake IDs for to get access to a library that they were denied access to, we would be living in an amazing society, you right. know, that's usually not how people use fake IDs. Um, but I remember hearing that story and that just shows the dedication and the thirst of the Baha'i community for education there, you know, yes. that they're willing to go to such lengths. Um, to do something that we all just take advantage of. We all in Urbana-Champagne have public libraries that we can just go into yeah, and we have all the books we want. Right, it's taken for granted. Taken for granted, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that was one of the stories from the documentary that really stuck with me is using a fake ID to go to the library, you know. And it's, right. we're very fortunate, you know, very fortunate. Well, it's, yeah. I, it's my understanding if you – it's my understanding if you are to – if a Baha'i were to go to – a university to uh, register, you have to put down what religion you are, mm -hmm. and there is no place that says other. Nope. So if a Baha'i were to check that they were Muslim in order to be able to attend, well, they maybe get through school, but once they got out of school, became known that they really were a Baha'i, mm -hmm. that would be a death sentence. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, just goes against the Baha'i principle that you can't recant your faith oh, for absolutely. expediency, for, yeah. you know, personal benefit. Um, it's interesting, the story of uh, Roxana Saberi, the journalist who was also imprisoned in Iran, um, and she was placed into the same prison, Evan Prison, which is known as the mm -hmm. worst prison in Iran. Um, that That's the prison where the Baha'i leaders are currently imprisoned and have yes. been for the past seven years. Hmm. So generally when... Journalists or dissidents or Baha'is or anyone else is imprisoned by the Iranian government. Normally, they want a confession and they want them to recant whatever they've done, you know. And for Baha'is, that's recanting your faith. So as long as you recant your faith and say, I accept Muhammad, I am Muslim, they let you go scot-free. But, mm -hmm. you know, no Baha'is do that. They, they say, right. I'm Baha'i, right. I'm not willing to say I'm anything else, I'm sorry, you know. So... When Roxana Saberi was captured and imprisoned, they asked her to say that she was, uh, they asked her to confess certain things, that she was working for the Western media and she was mm -hmm. working as a spy or whatever, all these crazy charges that they placed against her. And she wanted to get out of jail. So she said, okay, fine, I'll say whatever you want me to say, you know. So she does that. She gives her confession. They say, okay, we'll let you out tomorrow. She goes back to her jail. And she meets one of the Baha'is, one of the Baha'i leaders who's imprisoned, and she starts talking to her and she's like, oh, yeah, I just had to confess these things and they're letting me go. Why haven't you confessed or why haven't you recanted your faith? You'd get out. And I think it was Mahfash Sabet, who's one of the Yaron, huh. one of the leaders of the Baha'is, who said, I, I can't do that. How, how could I say I'm not a Baha'i when I'm a Baha'i? I mean, right. I, I know I've been in prison for five years, but I can't just say I'm not a Baha'i, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was that that triggered in Roxana Saberi's heart, I've made a mistake. I can't go against my principles just for my personal benefit. I can't do these things and make this false confession and basically lie just mm -hmm. to get out of jail because that's, you know, what I want. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was an interesting story. Yeah. yeah. That is wonderful. So if people want to join in this endeavor, what could they do? 
Well, I'm glad you asked, Marilyn. Uh, there's many things that they can do. So the first thing is that um, there's a lot more information to learn. Of course, we're going to watch this documentary, which kind of details, um, mm -hmm. you know, the issues that the Baha'is are facing. Um, but there's a lot more information to go out there and uh, learn about. So there's a couple of resources for that. So one, um, this specific campaign has its own website, which is educationisnotacrime.me. That's dot M-E at the end. Um, so that talks not only about um, the purpose of the current campaign, but also all the different people that have come out and support it and have mentioned their support for it. Right. Um, so, for example, there's statements by uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who recently yes. came out and was supporting this. And mm -hmm. um, Rain Wilson went to support and many other you know people that are you know catching wind of this are really getting behind it, which is great. Um, there's also a Facebook page. Just um, ed if you search education is not a crime, you'll get to the Facebook page. Right. Um, as I mentioned before, we're going to have this Twitter hashtag education is not a crime. If you have a Twitter handle, you want to get on Twitter, join the conversation. Um, you know, and I really want to stress that because one of the things that we've seen in regards to uh, the history of the Baha'is in Iran is that although there's a lot of persecution still being faced by that community, it has gotten a little bit better, right? Mm -hmm. So people were being outright executed day in, day out for quite a period of time, particularly wow. after the uh, Iranian Revolution. Um, you know, there were a lot of very high-ranking Baha'is killed very quickly. In fact, you know, the, the Baha'i community is democratically governed. We don't have any clergies or individuals who, you sure. know, have the authority to interpret the word of God for anyone mm -hmm. else. But we do have elected bodies. So for every, in every community where there's at least nine Baha'is, we have a locally elected body. For every country, we have a nationally elected body, and then we also have an international body that kind of governs the affairs of the yes. international community. So after the Iranian Revolution in 1979, the National Assembly in Iran um, was captured and never heard from again, right? Um, and it, it's almost the equivalent of, you know, in a political sense, like something like the Supreme uh the Supreme Court. Just, I mean, those, right. those are the people that they're the, I don't want to say highest ranking, but some of the most well-respected, uh, knowledgeable people in the Baha'i community in Iran, yes. all of them were captured and just executed overnight, you know? And that actually happened a second time. Mm -hmm. So um, another assembly was elected shortly thereafter. All of them were captured, just executed, you know? Right. Um, and this has happened a couple times. So eventually the Baha'i community in Iran said, well, maybe we shouldn't have an assembly anymore, right? Maybe we'll just have a more informal group of people that will kind of govern the affairs of the community, but mm -hmm. we won't have an elected national assembly like we did before. Well, we established another one of those bodies in Iran, and they were all captured, mm -hmm. and they're now in prison. But because of so much of the pressure that the Baha'i community and the international community has put on the Iranian government, they were not executed like, you know, the previous assemblies were. Right. So although there's still a lot of persecution taking place, what we're seeing is that things can get better if we raise our voices, if yes. we draw attention to the cause, yeah. if we put pressure on the Iranian government and view this not as, you know, the issues of a religious minority in this country, but as a mm -hmm. human rights issue, right? right? Which right. we definitely believe it is. So simply by joining the conversation, by talking about it, by talking about it with your friends, we really think we can increasingly put more pressure um, on the government to try to, you know, treat the Baha'is a little bit better. Yeah, right. and, and the other minorities there too. And yeah, so many groups. I mean, that's one of the, you know, bad and good things is that the Baha'is aren't the only group being persecuted. And when we see the persecution happening to journalists or other religious minorities mm -hmm. or other dissidents, um, more and more people are starting to put pressure on the Iranian government to change. So, um, I mean, it's obviously terrible and unfortunate that so many different groups are um, facing this type of persecution. But if there's any silver lining, it is the fact that more people are drawing attention to it and there's at least uh, some inklings that the Iranian government is starting to treat its citizens a little more equitably, or at least has the potential to do so in the near future. So, mm. Well, I think, too, it's uh, though the Baha'is are a minority, they are the largest minority mm -hmm. in Iran, and I believe that there's like some 300,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's not just a little group of people. That's no. a pretty good-sized <laughs> right. group of people. It is. And uh, I... At the time that the 
uh, leadership, how, I don't know how many years ago was that now that they were imprisoned, uh, seven, I think it has mm -hmm. been, yeah. that uh, people living in America, in the United States, from Iran, had were, were just so upset about what was happening in their country that even though they were not Baha'is themselves, uh, they had sent out a um, paper, I think there were some 200 people in the United States from Iran uh, voiced their discontent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about what was happening. Mm -hmm. And so it is uh, the Iranian people, uh, except for those who are kind of egged on, like you say, by the clergy, mm -hmm. seem to have an understanding that the Baha'is are not what the government is trying to say that they are. Yeah. I, you know, they, they are not ignorant people. They see for themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Matt, we want to thank you so much for coming today and tell us about what's been going on with the Baha'i faith in Iran. That's been very good to hear, uh, hear you talk about it. So, let's see here. Uh, when We will be going on to devotional readings in a few minutes, and Matt, I hope you will join us in that. Absolutely.
Smoke rose from the broken town Fire red in the dark She sang, she sang Her sweetest song Nobody heard but a child Nobody heard but a child Slow, slow her wings did go So low was her heart Winter ice whipped like a knife She sought a ledge to retire She sought a ledge to retire And over the rivers, over the towns Over the cities and on every road She sang of peace to high and low But nobody wanted to know Nobody wanted to know Sad she flew to a whitening pine Fearing peace had no chance Trying to sleep she counted snowflakes That fell on a neighboring branch That fell on a neighboring branch One, two, three Four and five Six, seven and eight By five hundred Her eyes hadn't closed Snow piled up on the bark Snow piled up on the bark When she had reached Three thousand and nine The branch Suddenly cracked like a fire Woke her up with a violent start As the timber crashed in the night As the timber crashed in the night One tiny flake when joined to the rest Snapped the branch like a sword Could one more voice join to the rest Break the irons of war Break the irons of war The heart of the dove Beat warm and fast A bright light she suddenly saw Perhaps I need find just one more soul To sever the shackles of war To sever the shackles of war So she lifted her wings And left the white tree On a mission in the dark night Crossing highways and over the sea She is calling to you and to me She is calling to you and to me Come to peace Come to peace Oh, come to peace It is for the will, and through the manifestation of his own self, that God hath fashioned, out of his own self, eighteen souls, ere the creation of all things, and he hath enshrined the sign of their recognition in the inmost reality of all things, that all, from the depths of their essence, may bear witness that he is the primal unity 
and the eternal and the ever abiding. Know thou that he is the supreme mirror of God, out of whose revelation is manifested the worldly mirror, which is not but the letters of the living, and not is seen in that supreme mirror of God, but God. He is the first, yet not defined as such, and he is the last, but not described as such. He is the seen and not praised as such, and he is hidden and not recognized as such. Just as the root principles of religion and its faith, people have progressed beyond the physical realm, the divine signs have also infinitely advanced beyond the limited physical realm. Thus, it is supremely necessary that the testimony of that servant should belong to the realm that surpasseth the world of intellect, which is not but the stations of true recognition and transcendent unity. From all eternity I have indeed recognized thee, and unto all eternity will ever do so through thine own self, and not through any one else besides thee. Verily thou art the source of all knowledge, the omniscient. From everlasting I have besought, unto everlasting I will beseech forgiveness for my limited understanding of thee, aware as I am that there is no God but thee, the all-glorious, the almighty. Glorified is he besides whom there is none other God. In his grasp he holdeth the source of authority, and verily God is powerful over all things. We have decreed that every long life shall in truth suffer decline, and that every hardship shall be followed by ease, that perchance men may recognize the gate of God as he who is the eternal truth. And verily God shall stand as witness unto those that have believed. Know thou that the essence of religion is the knowledge of God. The perfection of this knowledge is belief in his unity. The perfection of this belief is the negation of all names and attributes before his sanctified essence. And the perfection of this negation is to immerse oneself with certain knowledge in the ocean of oneness and to witness one's attainment to its bounty. The music on today's program are Is There Any Remover of Difficulties by Mansur Sobhani, River of Light, Blessed is the Spot, and Whither Can a Lover Go, sung by Grant Hinden Miller. If you would like to learn more about the Baha'i community in the Champaign-Urbana area, or any of the activities we have mentioned today, you can visit our website at www.cu-bahai.org If you would like to learn more about the Baha'i Faith, you may go to www.bahai.us If you would like to contact the local Baha'i community in Champaign-Urbana, please visit our website at www dot cu dash b a h a i dot o r g and click contact thank you again for joining us today i hope you'll join us again next month goodbye thanks for listening to this week's weekend heartbeat on w e f t champagne ninety point one f m community radio champagne urbana illinois streaming live at www.weft.org. dot w e f t dot org